how are you guys? Dr. How? Yes, I'm yeah. fine. Thank you. Good. <laughs> Good. Uh, <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. I have not met you yet. My name's my name's Wes. Um, uh, I'm one of the Global Health Fellows, so doing the lecture today. Okay. Hello, Wesley. Hey. Let's see. So I'm, I'm coming to Vietnam in June. 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 Yeah. How many days? How many days? Uh, like eight, eight days, seven, eight days. Not too long. Yeah. I can't, yes. can't stay too long. I have a newborn baby. <laughs> no sleep. <laughs> no sleep. Very tired here, but <laughs> I'm looking forward to seeing you all. We're gonna yeah. have um, we're gonna plan to to have some lectures, to do some ultrasound day, do some uh, simulation, um, yeah. kind of game impact pool of uh, some education for you guys. So yeah, good. Good. Okay. Um, is this all that's going to be joining us, or is Huang uh, or Han joining us? Or, um, let's see. Let me see who's on the email initially. How hot is it in Vietnam right now? Yeah, so hot in Vietnam. <laughs> about uh, uh, temperatures about uh, more than uh, 35 Celsius degree. Oh, okay. <laughs> so hot oh, for you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we're uh, not that hot. We're like, um, let me see. So we are. 19. 19. Oh, okay. Yeah. It is okay. It's very nice. nice. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well. Yeah. Well, yeah. When temperatures like that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's much easier to sleep. Right? <laughs> okay. Um, well, let's uh, let's go ahead and uh, start the lecture. Um, I'm going to change this around just a little bit and uh, we'll go through the questions first um, that Molly had sent out. Share my screen. Okay, you guys can see that? We can see. We yeah, can yeah, see. We can see. Great. Okay, hello, Dr. Han. Good to see you. <laughs> oh, your microphone is not working. I can hear you. I can hear you clearly. Okay. Okay. All right. So let's go through the first question. Um, so we have a 18 year old that comes to the emergency department uh, after falling off a cliff and hitting his head. Uh, you um, are on scene and his GCS is five. He's intubated. On physical exam, you notice bruising behind his ears, periorbital ecchymosis and hemotympanum, so blood behind the ear. Um, which of the falling bones is most likely fractured? And let's see if I can, uh, I want to start the, oops. Um, I'm having a hard time throwing up my Zoom to be able to start the, the poll. 
the weather real quick. Let me see if I can do this. If people want to shout out what they, they think the answer is, you can go ahead and do that while I try to get this. Hmm. Well, I made the poll, but it doesn't look like it wants to let me share it. <laughs> so what do we think? Is it A, an ethmoid fracture, B, occipital, C, sphenoid, or D, temporal? Let's see what people in chat. B thinks ethmoid. Oh, here we go. I think I can... Aha, you pulled up in the chat and then let me, uh, here we go. We can do this. All right, so it's anonymous. So you can um, you can just uh, answer how you think uh, so everyone can participate. You can see where. Where we're at. Okay. Okay. All right, so um, half the people got, got the question right. Um, so the, the correct answer is going to be E. Um, so it's a temporal bone. Um, and so with, uh, with the temporal bone um, fracture, uh, you will see uh, hemotympanum, um, rhinorrhea, otorrhea, uh, and you can also get a CSF leak with those as well. Uh, so just looking for those um, signs on exam that would suggest a basilar skull fracture um, are kind of those, these are the worrisome signs that we need to watch for on our physical exam. Okay. Let's go to the next question. All right, so um, we have a 29 year old man who is involved in a motor vehicle collision and thrown from the vehicle. He arrives in in your AD on a backboard and a cervical collar is in place. You you notice uh, you're, you're very suspicious for a cervical spine injury and note gurgling respirations. The patient's vital signs are a blood pressure of 110 over 75, heart rate of 110, respiratory rate of 20, and a pulse ox of 88%. Uh, your lung sounds are clear. Which of the following is the next best step in management? So. Is it A, change the rigid cervical collar to a semi-rigid collar and establish a definitive airway without removing the collar? B, is it, you know, keep the cervical collar on and use video laryngoscopy? Um, C, place a non-rebreather and obtain a um, cervical spine x-ray? Or D, remove the cervical collar, maintain inline immobilization and establish a definitive airway? So... That's a kind of a tricky question, a lot of different ways to approach this, um, but let me open up the poll and see what people, see what people think. Um, and uh, yeah. Okay. In the poll there. So the answer that you know Molly had wanted was D, but I, I think B is an okay um, an okay option. Uh, using video laryngoscopy, laryngoscopy um, will allow you to usually intubate these patients. The one caveat being if there's a lot of um, secretions and you can't you can't see with the video. Um, sometimes that can be a problem. Um, when you remove the C-collar, um, really you, you should have another, um, another provider or nurse hold the patient's um, neck very still um, and uh, keep that um, immobilization. But with that cervical collar out of the way, you can do, it, do some other maneuvers to help you intubate. And, and sometimes that can be really helpful um, and, such as, you know, using, using your other hand to manipulate the larynx, um, to get yourself a better view or applying some pressure. Um, and, uh, so maybe this is the more preferable option, but I think B is a totally fine option. Um, I think 
C is definitely the one that I would not do um, just because, you know, a non-rebreather is not going to help this patient with the GCS of 5. We know we should um, establish a more definitive airway. So, okay. All right, so question number three, a 23-year-old man with no past medical history presents to the emergency department after getting in a fist fight with his friend. Um, examination shows a four centimeter laceration to the right side of his forehead. When asked to raise his eyebrows, he's only able to lift his left eyebrow. So what is the most appropriate way to repair this wound? Hmm. So asking about kind of how would we repair? So let me, uh, let me start the next poll and see what people think. So for sake of time, we'll just, um, 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 so most people said D, which um, that's what I would say um, as well. Uh, so I think what they're getting at here is that this is a very deep uh, laceration because the patient is not able to, so they've lacerated the muscle and so they can't raise the eyebrow. And whenever you have a deeper laceration, um, that could involve the galia and you want to close that um, with two um, sets of sutures. So one set of sutures that's deep, um, that has um, some absorbable sutures, um, and then uh, the um, outside you could use permanent sutures or you know the sutures that you remove. Um, I don't typically repair a lot of these. We usually have our, our um, we have our plastics team that repairs them for, for us, um, but uh, something to, to be aware about and, and to make sure that you repair the, the galia if it's torn. Okay. Um, which of the following eyelid lacerations requires an emergent ophthalmology consult? Pretty quick question. Let's just uh, launch that poll and see what people think. right as well. So the answer is C, um, an eyelid laceration that has um, visible fat protruding. Uh, so when you see that visible fat, and actually I just had a, um, I, I was working in the emergency department last night and we just saw a patient that had this. Um, she was a bit, not by a dog, but by another human um, in a fight. <laughs> uh, but she, um, she had this fat that was protruding. And so whenever you see that, that suggests that the orbital septum um, has been um, compromised. Uh, and so when you have an orbital septum that has been damaged, you have a higher risk for orbital injury. And those patients usually need um, uh, ophthalmology evaluation and repair. Um, a dog bite, um, you know, certainly is going to be complicated and depending on what it looked like would maybe need ophthalmology as well. But, um, that was, that's the answer to this one. The other kind of recommendations is if it involves any of the lacrimal, um, duct or it's very close to that medial campus, um, those, those are pretty hard repairs and, and need to need to be done by a specialist. Okay. 
All right. A 20-year-old man presents to the emergency department after being struck in the nose with a ball. He is complaining of nasal pain and deformity. His examination is significant for a distorted nasal ridge, consistent with a fracture, and you also notice a septal hematoma in the right nair. Secondary survey does not show any other injuries. He is otherwise appearing well. What's the appropriate management of this patient's condition? So, uh, let me this one's a little this one's a little tricky because i think there's a few answers that i would um i think would be appropriate Okay, um, so looks like uh, some people said B, um, follow up with ENT for management of the fracturing hematoma, and some people said C, incision and drainage of the septal hematoma. I think both of these are good answers. Um, I'm wondering what Molly actually put here. Um, I mean, you should, if you do see a septal hematoma, um, you should try to drain that um, septal hematoma before the patient leaves. Um, the emergency department um, because that that pressure can cause some deformities pretty quickly um, and so um, usually that's a, an appropriate management um, and let's see so they said C so um, and, and the reason you want to drain these uh, is uh, so there's a um, uh, let's see. Uh, 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 your uh, is not muted. Could you uh, mute your microphone, please? My bạn chờ nãy tắt mic giùm đi. Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, we got to know. Yeah. No, that's okay. That's okay. Uh, so, uh, to the septal hematoma, you should drain these, um, uh, they usually require, uh, operative repair, um, if it develops into, um, necrosis of the septum, that can happen if you, um, don't leave it, uh, if you don't, uh, don't, uh, drain it. So, um, that drainage, uh, you can basically take some lidocaine um, and um, you can soak a um, a pledget or um, some some um, some gauze, shove it up in the nose to kind of get some anesthesia, um, and then you're just going to make a very small incision um, with a scalpel blade um, through the hematoma and uh, just kind of try to evacuate the clots, um, and then you pack that hematoma with a little bit of gauze too to help prevent it from reaccumulating. Um, I don't, I don't generally, uh, see these very often. Um, but this is one of those kind of indications that we should try to do this drainage in order to prevent, um, development of this saddle nose deformity. Okay. All right. So last question, um, a 33 year old man with no past medical history, um, presents with a headache three days after a closed head injury. He states that he was um, standing up um, when he hit his head on the wood cabinet, and he didn't have any loss of consciousness, no seizure activity. Um, he has some difficulty concentrating at work, and he has a headache. His physical exam is otherwise unremarkable. So 
So if you saw this patient, what should be our kind of appropriate, um, oops, appropriate next step? Now that everyone knows, let's still do the poll in case you weren't paying attention. And uh, what should we, uh, what should be our answer here? All right, so I'm just, I'll share the results. So yes, most people uh, got this correct. It's referred to outpatient neurology. Um, so this patient, you know, is coming in, has symptoms of a concussion, um, but they don't need emergent neurology consultation. They don't need a CT head um, because their exam is pretty much unremarkable, right? And they, um, this happened three days ago. So they don't have any of the high risk factors for needing a CT. Um, and, uh, you know, outpatient MRI is probably not like a uh, totally wrong answer. You could consider that an appropriate patient, but most of these patients will do just fine with um, some close follow-up outpatient. Um, so we have our kind of classification system that we'll talk about in our lecture today about um, traumatic brain injury, but, but um, it's a spectrum. And so traumatic brain injury can be anywhere from you know, very mild, like this patient um, that we just had, where, you know, they hit their head and they're having difficulty concentrating. Um, but uh, otherwise, those patients generally recover very, very well to um, patients with uh, very severe traumatic brain injury. Um, and those patients have, you know, are unconscious for more than 24 hours. Um, their initial, initial GCS is three to eight. Um, and uh, they have some very long-term um, comorbidities and complications that arise from, from a severe head injury like this. So that ends our pre-reading questions. Any, any uh, questions or comments on that? Um, and we'll, uh, if not, we'll get ready for the next lecture. I just want to make sure I know everyone, um, since we've had some people um, join just slightly late. Um, I know Dr. Weedy and Dr. Pond. I um, met, um, is it uh, Dr. Uh, Pham Pak Yen? Yeah. Uh, so my name is Dr. Nyong. Dr. Nyong, very nice to meet yes, you. Yes, I'm like, okay. yeah, nice to meet you. Okay. Good. Okay, and I know Dr. Han, and I know Dr. Dai. Okay, so my name is Wes. Um, I'm, I'm one of the Global Health Fellows. Um, for uh, the people that haven't met me, I've been a little bit away from from the Global Health uh, Diploma, trying to uh, raise my new newborn baby. Um, that has been uh, very tough. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm looking forward to, to visiting you all in June. I'm actually going to be... Uh, being flying, uh, flying down there in June, and I'll be able to see you all and be able to do some teaching in person and look forward to, to seeing you guys. So, okay, with that, we'll, uh, we'll start our lecture on traumatic brain injuries, which is very important. Chorai sees lots of traumatic brain injuries, correct? I remember because I was there <laughs> it's a couple of years ago. Lots of lots of people. Two years ago only. Was your yeah. January twenty twenty? Yep, twenty twenty. Yeah, right before COVID. <laughs> before COVID. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's see if I can share this lecture. This lecture was prepared mostly by Matt, uh, who's not with us today. He made a nice lecture, so I'm going to steal it from him. And. Uh, Kind of talk about trauma and our traumatic brain injury. So continue in our trauma module. All right. Move things around. So objectives of this lecture is just let's define what a traumatic brain injury is, which we kind of did in, in the pre-reading questions. How do we evaluate and treat? 
and uh, you know what's the what's kind of uh, management of kind of concussions which fall into that traumatic brain injury. So I'd like to start off with a case. So I actually saw. So this is a real case. Um, I saw this patient um, when I was working in Wyoming um, two weeks ago, um, and uh, kind of a, a scary situation. Um, and uh, so the the case is a 35 year old male is brought in. Um, to the emergency department after falling and hitting his head. Only thing you know about his history is he does um, drink alcohol quite heavily and he has cirrhosis. His, his initial GCS is 10, but he declines to 3 pretty quickly. Um, and your vital signs are notable for a blood pressure of 180 over 110, a heart rate of 54, and O2 sats of 90% on 15 liters. So, um, this patient's in your in your emergency department, and they they don't look good. They have a GCS of three, and um, what what should be our our steps in trauma? What should we do uh, to help this patient? Sorry, what was that, Doctor? Yeah. The patient needs uh, oxygen, mm -hmm. and after that, uh, we turn for the patient to sit has scan. Perfect. Sit scan. Yes. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, all of our trauma patients, we also have kind of an algorithm, right, that we, we try to follow when they come in, um, and uh, you know, ABC, right, and we kind of hammer this in just so we don't miss things too, because sometimes. You know, we, we could miss something, but I totally agree. We need to get this patient oxygen or a, um, an airway. Um, so uh, we think about airway for our A. Um, this patient has a GCS of three. They're not protecting their airway. So they should be intubated before they go to the CT scanner, right? Um, because otherwise they could, they could choke, they could aspirate, they could, you know. Um, yeah. And uh, some of these patients even have... Um, Maybe their their GCS is four or five, so they're moving around, but they can't follow around, you know, the CT scan. So we gotta um, paralyze and intubate them. Um, so airway for this patient is pretty key, right? Um, so the next thing is breathing. Um, so we assess their breathing with looking for bilateral breath sounds, make sure that they don't have other things in a trauma that we would be concerned about. So yes, we we've got a he we've got a head bleed um, most likely in this patient, right? Um, a very bad traumatic brain injury, um, but they also fell. So they could have hit their chest. They could have had rib fractures. They could have a pneumothorax. We need to make sure they don't have that um, because let's say we don't, let's say we just intubate them. We're like, oh, I think he's got a head bleed. We send them to the CT scanner. Oh, but we forgot to listen to their breath sounds and they've got a pneumothorax and now they have a, uh, a pneumothorax in the CT scanner That's and, and then they could, they could die from the pneumothorax, right? So we got to make sure we um, listen to the breath sounds and circulation. We want to make sure they've got at least pulses um, and uh, blood pressure, make sure they're not bleeding somewhere quite heavily um, where they would need blood or fluids. Um, and then we also could consider disability too. So in this patient, um, what is their kind of neuro status before we intubate them? Neurosurgery likes to know that, hey, were they moving their arms? Were they, you know, muttering? Were they, were they trying to talk? Um, so those are important. So in this patient, when he came in, we did those things. We um, first um, intubated the patient because the patient was GCS of three and needed to have airway protection. And we listened to uh, make sure the patient had breath sounds, had a good blood pressure, and then we sent them to CT scanner. Um, and so this is what we found on CT scan. What does that look like? Subdural and hematoma. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's uh, that is a bad subdural hematoma, and we're seeing that midline shift. Right, that's the other thing that we look at. The brain is shifting over because that blood. There's no space for the brain to move when there's blood in the in the skull. So all it can do is shift over. 
Um, and uh, if we if we go back to the case, um, we're kind of seeing signs of that, right? The patient's GCS is three, um, but also we look at their blood pressure and their heart rate in patients with impending herniation um, or very bad midline shift. What happens to our blood pressure and heart rate? And uh, maybe we get Cushing uh, syndrome. Cushing syndrome, absolutely correct. Yeah. Um, yep. So that's what we're seeing there. Um, excellent job. So um, that's just a case to kind of get things started. Let's talk about just a little bit of epidemiology. Um, so mostly male um, patients that that have traumatic brain injuries. Um, there's a trimodal distribution, so zero to four years old that have falls. Fifteen to twenty-five are the people that think they're invincible and they get motor vehicle crashes or scooter accidents. Um, and then when they're over sixty-five, um, those patients fall, you know, because they're they're older, they they don't have balance, um, and so those are kind of our three main age groups. You can have bleeds and, and injuries outside of that. Um, so what makes a, G, uh, a traumatic brain injury mild, moderate, or severe? That's depending on the kind of their initial GCS, how long they were um, unconscious. And so with mild, their GCS is 14, 15. Um, moderate, uh, we have a GCS of 9, 13, and uh, severe uh, GCS less than 8. Most of the patients that we see fall into the mild category, um, but the 10% in the moderate and severe um, generally require you know, quite a um, bit of active management. So um, for uh, mortality, uh, for all of our trauma, um, it accounts for 30% of our trauma mortality. So in the United States, so it makes up a good portion. So trauma is not, you know, the most common thing in the United States um, uh, in terms of mortality, but um, I think it's like fourth or fifth. Uh, but out of that trauma, there's 30 percent that is um, due to uh, bad brain injury. And I know those numbers are, are pretty high in Vietnam as well. Um, so something we see quite a bit in the emergency department and we should uh, know how to, to manage. So how does, how does a brain injury, traumatic brain injury occur? There's several different ways. So in the case that we saw, um, that was from a, a hematoma. Um, but you also get damage from either kind of direct damage or strain to the brain parenchyma. Like a, you can get a contusion. Um, the hematomas, which you can be epidural, subdural, subarachnoid, intraparenchymal, and subarachnoid. Um, so I recognize myself twice. Um, you also can get something that's called a diffuse axonal injury. Um, that's a shear injury, and those are really, really bad. Um, so it actually doesn't look too impressive on a CT scan. So maybe they, when they come in, they usually have, a, you know, they're in the severe category. So their GCS is very low, but you get this DT and there's no bleed. And you're like, hey, it actually looks like things are okay. Um, but once you get the MRI, um, or CT later, you see evidence of this diffuse axonal injury. What happens is the brain moves, it's going very, very fast and it stops and it shears all of those, all of those neurons um, in the brain. Very, very devastating injury. Um, and uh, usually the recovery from it is, is, is pretty minimal. Um, okay. Uh, so these are just to kind of review, hey, what does our, um, what do our injuries look like on CT? Uh, we've got uh, a first, uh, first top there. That's the big scary one, epidural um, hematoma. Um, those um, are lenticular uh, in, in appearance. So they're um, Kong, uh, convex, uh, whereas subdurals are more concave. Um, you know, the, uh, the management of, of both of these are pretty similar, like epidural hematomas expand quicker, whereas subdural hematomas are slower because it's veins versus an artery. Um, the classic kind of presentation for an epidural hematoma is a, 
patient that hits their head, it's unconscious and uh, looks pretty bad, but then they come in and they're actually looking okay. And then they, they crash very quickly because that blood starts to reaccumulate really quickly and starts you know, on the brain. It needs to be uh, managed um, by the neurosurgeon to drain that. Um, so subarachnoid hemorrhages, not as common in trauma, but can still be seen. They're more common in like, um, uh, in, uh, in kind of aneurysms. Um, and then, uh, intraparenchymals are even less common, um, in traumas. Um, so those are kind of our different, different bleeds and injuries. So how do we evaluate these patients? Well, you know, in any trauma patient, we should have a standardized approach because we don't want to miss things. Trauma is very difficult because our trauma is not difficult because we, if we have a very like set approach to it, we just, we won't miss things. Um, and, uh, but we need to, we need to be very, uh, meticulous. We need to be very detailed so that we don't, it's very easy to get focused in on something like in this patient before, um, or in any patient, they come in and they're complaining, oh, my chest, after getting, you know, hit by a car or something like that. Um, and there's a lot of bruising on the chest. And you get so focused on the chest that maybe you forget or miss and you you don't you do not do a good um, exam of the lower extremities and you miss an open fracture. Or something like that. So we got to be very meticulous in how we approach these patients. Um and so our, our physical exam, should we should expose the patient, take off all the clothes, make sure there's no other injuries. And then we, we can see what um, Dr. Heppel had, um, had, had mentioned, Cushing's reflex. That is a um, later sign, something that's a uh, pretty bad prognosis, meaning that there's likely impending herniation of the brain um, and we need to act quickly. Um, so we see hypertension, uh, bradycardia, and uh, respiratory irregularities. Uh, in terms of the labs that we want to get, kind of just standard labs uh, that we get in all our trauma patients, a CBC, a, a BMP. Um, we also want to get coags, see if there are anticoagulated, do we need to reverse them? Um, and then CT uh, is the next thing, these traumatic brain injuries. But as Matt has placed here, not every patient that comes and hits their head needs a CT. Uh, we have uh, different calculators or decision rules um, that we can make. Um, and so these are a couple that we use here in the U.S. Um, the reason we don't get CTs on everyone because lots of people hit their head and they don't need a CT. Uh, and if we got CTs on everyone, then we'd have a hard time getting CTs done, you know, people that really need them. So we don't want to uh, over, over, over utilize our, our resources. Um, so, uh, these are the, uh, specific rules that we do use. Um, and I can, uh, I can send these out in a, in a follow-up email. Um, Canadian CT head rule is probably the most common. We're not in Canada, but we use it. And, uh, it is, uh, it looks at a lot of patients, that were in these low risk categories. Um, and so if they, if they didn't have any of these high risk features, then we didn't get a CT scan on them and patients did totally fine and, and didn't need it. So, uh, so if they, if they had a GCS less than 15, um, if they had a suspected open or depressed skull fracture, any sign of a ba uh, a basilar skull fracture, right? The raccoon eyes, hemotympanum, we talked about in the pre-reading questions, two or more episodes of vomiting. So they can have one episode of vomiting and then any patient 65 years or older. So this helps rule out quite a bit of patients that we don't have to get a CT scan on. It's not a rule that I memorize. Um, I don't, I don't memorize this. I actually just look it up. Um, if I'm, if I'm thinking that the patient doesn't need a CT scan, I just want to double check. I just open this up and there's a website called MD calc. Um, I'll put it in the chat chat. Very easy to use, um, lots of different decision uh, rules on that website. And you can just, you know, click what the, if the patient has them or not, and it tells you whether they should get a CT scan or not. Okay. 
So let's say the patient comes in with a very severe TBI. Um, our goal in our treatment as emergency medicine physicians, you know, they, they eventually will need, they may need neurosurgery to, to weigh in and, and have neurosurgery, either if there's a large hematoma, during the hematoma, or just manage these factors, but we can also manage these in the emergency department too. And essentially our goal is to um, decrease the effect of uh, intracranial pressure, right? The head is a fixed space. We can't get the head bigger. Only neurosurgery can do that by taking a piece of the skull off. They can get the head, head bigger. Um, so it's fixed space. So we need to do our best to make sure that the pressure isn't too high in the, in the, in the skull, because if it's too high, then we start to see further damage um, and disability uh, develop um, from that injury. So uh, ways to control this, and we'll talk about kind of each of these. Uh, we can control our oxygen and, uh, and CO2. So we want to make sure the patient is not, um, does not uh, have hypercarbia um, or even hypocarbia. So they basically have, they're intubated um, and we're ventilating them appropriately. If they have too much carbon dioxide, um, that can cause, um, can cause badness. Um, and and uh, we want to maintain kind of a cerebral perfusion pressure uh, of, you know, uh, a reasonable perfusion pressure. So cerebral perfusion pressure is our, um, our MAP minus our ICP. So our mean arterial pressure minus our intracranial pressure. So the uh, uh, way we can get that up is by sometimes driving up their systolic blood pressure. So we want to avoid low blood pressure in these patients. If they have low blood pressure um, because of low blood, we give them blood. If it's low blood pressure because something else that's going on, like neurogenic shock, we can give them pressors. We want to have their, have their blood pressure higher um, because that helps perfuse the brain. Um, other important things are seizure prophylaxis. Uh, so in patients with very large bleeds, blood is an irritant to the brain and can cause seizures. So we want to make sure that they don't have seizures because seizures will increase ICP. Uh, and then uh, we want to decrease metabolic rate. So um, basically not have the patient work super hard. Um, so that means we give them adequate um, analgesia and sedation. So fentanyl, propofol, we want to make sure that they're, they're calm. Um, and then uh, there's a couple other things to reduce ICP is osmotic therapies. So hypertonic saline or mannitol. And uh, we can also elevate the head of bed um, greater than 30 degrees. And then we also want to reverse coagulopathy. So if a patient is taking warfarin, we want to make sure that we give them vitamin K or FFP um, so that they can start to clot and the blood doesn't accumulate faster um, in, the, in the brain. So those are kind of the ways we can do this. So control ventilation and oxygenation. So we want to intubate early. Um, we don't want these patients to be hypoxic. Um, so um, you can intubate with a tominate or ketamine. Um, I know that there's um, thoughts that ketamine can increase your ICP and you should avoid it. Um, that has been kind of debunked from um, most studies that have looked at it, it says that ketamine is okay. So this is going to be provider preference. Um, but there may be some older physicians or physicians that kind of hold on to this mantra that, hey, don't use ketamine. Um, and then that's fine. You can use a top eight, but uh, uh, ketamine is, is, has been shown to be safe. Um, and then uh, really, uh, should we hyperventilate these patients, drive their CO2 down? It used to be thought that we should hyperventilate them. We should just probably keep their PCO2, PACO2 at 30 to 35. So you can hyperventilate them for a little bit in the emergency department, um, but don't do it for long term. If you just need a pinch, if you've noticed that, hey, the patient may be herniating now, you can try hyperventilating them to stave it off. But over a long term um, period, that's going to be harmful. Um, so 
our cerebral perfusion pressure. So we want a cerebral perfusion pressure of about 80. So like we said, that's MAP minus ICP. So if our MAP is less than 80, we can probably assume that our cerebral perfusion pressure is less than 60. So we either use blood products, crystalloids, or vasopressors um, to increase our systolic blood pressure. So if a patient has a systolic blood pressure of 90, very bad. Like they're 90 over 50, we need to do something about that. So either they're bleeding somewhere, we give them blood products, or we can give them um, phenylephrine. Is a vasopressor that we can do, or we can do norepinephrine. Um, some studies have shown that phenylephrine may be better. Um, seizure prophylaxis, like we talked about, uh, either phenytoin or um, Keppra. Uh, we do these a lot, but it doesn't seem to necessarily show a long-term benefit, but it's uh, probably worthwhile in a patient that has a very severe TBI, and the harm from it is likely very minimal. Uh, all right, so uh, decreasing cerebral uh, metabolic demand. So that's our sedation and analgesia. So fentanyl propofol, you could do something like uh, a barbiturate, like phenobarbital. Um, and then we want to avoid hyperthermia. Um, we don't cool these patients like we cool our cardiac arrest patients, um, but we don't want them to have a, a, heart, a temperature of like 39C. That's too hot. Um, so... Um, we would give them either Tylenol to keep them um, down, um, acetaminophen, uh, or um, do cooling outside the body. But we, we shoot for just a normal normal temperature, so 36 to 30, 38, or 37. Okay. Um, and then uh, reducing ICP, uh, so how we can manage our cerebral perfusion pressure, we can either increase our systolic blood pressure, or we can decrease the intracranial pressure. That's the only two ways that we can improve our cerebral perfusion pressure. So um, the definitive therapy, so if the patient has lots of blood from a hep epidural, is neurosurgery drains that either with the burr hole or takes a, does a craniotomy um, and helps relieve that pressure. Um, but there are some temporizing measures that we use in the emergency department hypertonic saline in mannitol. Um, hypertonic saline is the one that we prefer. Um, we rarely ever use mannitol because mannitol is a diuretic and will cause you to, um, many patients will, you'll give it to them. And yes, it, it helps with uh, decreasing the intracerebral pressure, but it'll also drop your systolic blood pressure. So we're going down in both directions. So benefit is net even rather than having like a increase with um, hypertonic saline. Usually we see an increase in the blood pressure and a decrease in the intracranial pressure. So those are the directions that we want to see. So we, we don't want to both be going down. So sometimes mannitol um, can cause that low blood pressure, but it is available. We just don't give it very much. Um, and then how do we uh, reverse our coagulopathies? Well, first, we only do these for patients that are taking anticoagulants. Um, you know, we get a PTINR. Um, we can get a, a what's called a thromboelastogram, which basically is a better profile. Of like, hey, is this patient? Which factors does this patient need or is missing? Uh, um, and we have different um, ways of uh, of reversing it. So, PCC, cryoprecipitate, um, fresh frozen plasma. Uh, and there's also some reversal agents that are very um, specific to, uh, like if someone was like on uh, Davagatraban, um, there's some reversal agents for those. Okay. So this is just um, sort of a summary of uh, what to do um, with a patient that comes in with first CT head um, and, they, and you notice a bleed. This goes through all of our um, anticoagulation reversal. Um, so warfarin, we give um, vitamin K, um, and then you can also give FFP or K-Centra, which is kind of the more expensive um, medication. Um, and then uh, there's also uh, patients that if you have them on aspirin, 
um, or Plavix or the anti-platelet um, medications. Uh, you can use um, Desmopressin um, is, is a possibility. Um, and then, uh, and then there's some other more specific treatments, but most of the time it's, it's either going to be, uh, FFP, um, or, uh, case center or PCC. Um, if you have that available, those are generally, you're never going to fail um, with giving those medications. And then, uh, what is the mild traumatic brain injury? So that last question that we had, um, in our pre-reading, well, these are patients that hit their head. They may become may they may come to the emergency department a few days later and say, "Hey, doctor, I have bad headaches. I can't concentrate. I I feel very angry. I can't sleep." Um, the duration of these can last for weeks, um, and they're quite distressing to the patient. But the patient doesn't need a CT scan. It's been a while since they hit their head. Um, CT scan is not likely to be helpful. Um, the biggest thing is that they need lots of rest um, and they uh, they need to minimize kind of screen time. So looking at computers and TVs and not hit their head again, uh, which kind of sounds obvious. But if you get repeat concussions, um, you can have some long term um, disability that develops. So that ends um, case our, our lectures on traumatic brain injuries. Um, Stop sharing. And uh, do you guys have any any recent cases at Joe or I? I'm sure there's, or even at the University Medical Center, of um, some some bad head injuries that you want to share, or any thoughts or questions. Always in yeah. our department, we don't usually, uh, um, or we don't usually, uh, or we don't have many, uh, many, uh, uh, medicine for IV to um, mm -hmm. uh, prevent uh, uh, seizure. Yeah, mm -hmm. to prevent seizure. just only uh, we use uh, um, one brush natri, one brush natri, and uh, and fenny to it, just mm -hmm. oral. Yeah. How about in your department? Yeah, we generally will use Keppra, which is the Levo, uh, Levo, Levo yeah. Racetam, Um and we yeah. give that IV. It's really safe and easy, but um, yeah, I guess you, depending on what you have available, you know, I guess uh, dropping an NG tube or something like that and giving phenytoin through the NG tube or OG tube um, oh. to, to get them get them that. I, it's also not like super... Um, I, I don't think it's the most important thing that we can do for our patients. Like, I think yes. more importantly is a raising their head of bed up, um, <laughs> uh, which do you guys like doing that or no? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and then hypertonic saline in neurosurgery, right? They need to see a neurosurgeon and they need to have a neurosurgeon yeah. either do craniotomy, take the skull off or pull the blood off. You laugh when I say raise the head of bed up. Yeah. <laughs> Why is that? Oh, we we don't have many experience. Oh, yeah, you because you, yeah, you don't have the <laughs> actual beds that can actually raise up. That's right. Yeah. And um, to uh, lower intra uh, cranial pressure, mm -hmm. we don't usually use uh, uh, hypertonic hypertonic uh, uh, saline. Yeah. Mm. Because we don't have many experience about them. Can you share many experience about to use uh, hypertonic saline for, for the, the patient? We use it quite a bit. If we, if we, again, it's just a temporizing measure. Like it's not, it's not something that's going to help long term. But um, so we generally shoot for sodiums above one hundred and fifty, um, and then um, uh, we can, if we, if the patient is starting to show that Cushing's response or like they're herniating, we yeah. can push, um, push the, you know, hypertonic saline to try to prevent that herniation. But, um, again, they're hopefully going to be to the OR with, uh, with a, with a neurosurgeon or someone that can actually definitively manage it. Yeah.
Hello, uh, Wesley. Uh, yeah. I have a uh, question for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, I often use uh, many terms for Asian, and I see that uh, the blood pressure will uh, go down when we mm-hmm. use, sometimes go down when we use many terms. Yeah. So, uh, to I want to ask you when if the blood pressure is uh, not really high, mm-hmm. about uh, 100 mm-hmm. on uh, 70, if do we shoot you many times? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so that's a that's a it's a tough it's a tough situation. I think uh, I we generally don't give it to patients if their blood pressure is less than 140. Um, so, but if it's above that and that's what we have as an option, um, then I think it's okay to give mannitol. So if their blood pressure is 170, um, and they're, and they need to have their, um, ICP, your, you know, intracranial pressure, um, lowered, then I think it's a reasonable thing to, uh, to attempt. Um, and, uh, but yeah, that's, a, that's the problem with it. it it's, 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 it can you know, if you if you give it and all of a sudden their blood pressure drops down to a hundred, um, well, we didn't we didn't really help the patients um, because even though we lowered their intracranial pressure, we lowered their systolic blood pressure, um, and so the cerebral perfusion pressure is the same. Um, but uh, in terms of de- how to how to determine that, we like at the university we will not give mandatory. Well, if their blood pressure is less than systolic blood pressure is less than 140, since we don't we won't use it. But that's a very so, good observation and question. Yeah. So you will use the hypertonic uh, study? Yes. Yeah. And, and that's going to be. If the blood pressure is uh, low, you mm-hmm. will use the hypertonic study? Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, okay. that, that will work um, better um, uh, for improving blood pressure, but also lowering the um, intracranial pressure. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions or concerns? And uh, about the uh, nemo dipping for for the patient in the surprise no? surprise it. Uh, do you use surprise noise? Yeah, surprise noise. Oh use yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, we do nemo use the Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, that's a that's a it's a great yeah. It's in, in the subarachnoid patient that is a non-traumatic uh, subarachnoid. Um, we use uh, the uh, and uh, yeah, this that has a pretty pretty decent like um, uh, benefit to those patients. So, um, yeah, cool. Um, so like I said, I'm coming to Vietnam in June. I'm gonna be, um, we'll be doing the cardiac module. Um, so um, plan is for, for doing some ultrasound, um, some simulation, um, you know, kind of do hands-on stuff. So I'm not just giving, you lectures. I can give you lectures over Zoom, but you know, we'll still do some lectures, but I really want to do some hands-on stuff. So I'm going to bring an ultrasound, we'll grab some ultrasounds, we'll, we'll, we'll do a lot of cardiac ultrasound, um, and then hopefully be able to do some simulation where we kind of practice running through um, maybe some hard, hard cases, um, and uh, I'll, make them, I'll make them difficult uh, so we can really use our brains and think. Um, but it should be a lot of fun. I really, really look forward to seeing you guys and uh, and just being able to learn and, and collaborate with you guys. So. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. So send me the lecture first, and I make it see me for you. you know, yes. First, and see me for one day morning for lecture and afternoon for procedure and hand yep. on ultrasound something like that. Okay. Yep. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> Okay. All right. Everyone, take care. Stay safe. Bye-bye. We'll see you guys yeah. next week. Have to. Yeah. Okay. Bye bye.